despite that low that low down beginning, I want to I want to assure you that I have a high goal for this morning. My my high goal for this morning is one maybe you can take beyond this corridor when you're done, which is to 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 try to give you the confidence and the ammunition to go out and convince people that philanthropy is is much more than just a kind of a nice decorative aspect of American culture. That it's much more than just a, a you know a, a pretty coat of paint on our national mansion. That it's it's a, a really important part of the actual uh, foundation and structure of our of our country. And so I'm going to give you a little evidence that'll um, I hope per convince you and help you convince others that philanthropy is really crucial in making us the unusual nation we are. So let's start with some brute numbers. Our nonprofit sector employs 11 percent of the workforce and uh, last year contributed about 6% of GDP. I know that doesn't mean much to people, so let me give you a little perspective here. This is the fraction of GDP that comes from the so-called military industrial complex. I mean, that's sort of a shorthand that people use to describe a formidable industry. Well, guess what? Um, you know, philanthropy passed the, the uh, national descent defense sector in size way back in 1993. And you know, you, information like this is really missing, I think, from most of our public debates, from, um, from journalism, from academic analysis. And uh, as a result, a lot of our citizenry really doesn't have any good sense of how important philanthropy is to our nation's health. So we tried. We decided to do something about that at the Philanthropy Roundtable. We created this book that Joanne mentioned. Um, all kinds of pieces of this. Those of you who don't know, it has a Philanthropy Hall of Fame. It has a, um, a, prof a section of profiles of about a thousand of the most important philanthropic achievements, literally from 1636 <laughs> up to 2015 in this country. It has a, uh, a whole bunch of uh, interesting uh, quotations on philanthropy. It has a very rich timeline. Oh, it has a very interesting essay, uh, which is the last chapter of the book, explaining why the charitable deduction exists and, and, and why it must continue to exist and so forth. And it's a very lively collection of, of Americana, really, that we think can fill some gaping holes in our national self-awareness. And I, I really want you to, I, pr I promise you that it, it's not as snoozy as it sounds. It's, I, it, it is an encyclopedia, but there are just Iliads and Odysseys of human interest in this that really make it fun to plow through. And let me illustrate that by starting with this guy. This is Ned McElhaney, <clears throat> who grew up in a Louisiana bayou, even though he is not wearing bayou clothing here for sure. <laughs> not even at Mardi Gras, they dress like that. But he had a kind of a Forrest Gump life. And among other things, he had a, a period where he spent time as an explorer in Alaska, did some really remarkable things in Alaska. When he got home, he wrote a book on alligators. He wrote a book on wild turkeys. He was one of the world's experts on camellias and then on the hundreds of species of bamboo. Just one of these guys that had interests and appetites all over the map. And um, as an ornithologist, he personally banded something like a quarter of a million birds. Here he is, um, all grown up, and I like to tell people at this point, you know, he's he's uh, he's buying life insurance and doing all those boring things that men capitulate to when they take off their furs and they put on their bow ties, <laughs> because Ned McElhaney, you have to remember, also had a day job like most of us, and his day job was marketing and selling the Tabasco sauce that his family had invented. Um, and it might sound like a funny niche to you, but let me assure you there's a lot of money in burning people's tongues. And he <laughs> used his profits for a really amazing array of good works. For one thing, he got attached to this fellow native of the bayou. Um, when McElhaney was young, there was this huge fashion craze for women's hats that included egret feathers. All right, now, who knows where this came from? But let me give you some examples. This is what I mean. I think this one is very fetching. You can understand why people would go a little crazy for this. Others were totally less understandable. <laughs> Although I, I think it's, it's the egret feathers are on her shoulders here. What's on her head? We don't know or why, but. This, this, this actually was happening and in a very silly fashion, but it had an unsilly effect, which was it was making the snowy egret almost extinct. They were just practically gone. And McElhaney noticed this and he sprang into action. So his family owned, continues to own, an island in Louisiana. And so he went out one day, literally beat the bushes on his island for two whole days. And in that period of time, he managed to find eight baby egrets in two nests. That was all he could find. And he put, literally stuffed them in the pockets of his hunting coat and went home. And he raised these babies in a protected area, paid for their care over a period of years. And when um, he was done, he had built up a population of about 100,000 egrets in this protected refuge. At the same time he was doing that, he recruited some of his philanthropy friends. John Rockefeller was part of this. Olivia Sage was part of this. And he encouraged them to buy up swampy uh, wasteland on the Louisiana coast, coast that was very important for uh, breeding grounds for the egrets. And in this way, he rescued a, just a really magnificent creature that was literally on the verge of disappearing from the earth. Now, he, um, 
he later took action. I, I, I love this kind of echo. He later took action to stave off a very different kind of extinction. This was kind of a human extinction. You know, I men mentioned he's a, he's a southern boy. He grew up with Negro spirituals in his ears, and he just loved them. Very important kind of songs for him. And later in his life, as best I can tell, around his 60th birthday, he noticed that he just wasn't hearing them anymore. And people didn't know them. They didn't know the words. And he realized they were at risk of dying out. You have to remember, these were just part of an oral tradition at that point. They had not been recorded. And so once again, he sprang into action. And once again, he used not just his checkbook, but his personal connections and his, and his energy. He found these two elderly women who lived very near him, actually. And they could remember lots and lots of these beautiful old songs. And so he sat them down. He hired a musicologist. And the two men asked these women to just sing their hearts out. And they, as fast as they could write, they recorded the lyrics and the melodies and the harmonies of these, um, of these songs to preserve them exactly as they've been handed down across generations of slaves. And he then published all these songs as a book, which became a classic of the genre. It's a terrible picture, but it's quite a rare book at this point. But in the process, Ned McElhaney captured 125 different spirituals, OK? I took some time to try to figure out how many of those had been uh, preserved elsewhere. And it turns out all but about five or six of these were only captured in his book. So they, they, there's a very high chance they would have disappeared from American history. Which you think what a tragedy that would be. He, he single-handedly saved them. And by the way, the songs that he saved included the one that Martin Luther King Jr. quoted in his most famous passage where he talked about free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last. That is a lyric from one of the songs that, um, that McElhaney preserved. And again, these are more than just songs. These are artifacts of American history. And it would, would have really been a tragedy to let them, to let them evaporate. Um, another red-blooded American philanthropist, I would say, who helped keep his fellow citizens lastingly free was this man. This is Alfred Loomis, who was just a science nut from when he was knee-high to a grasshopper. Uh, always loved experimentation. But when he was in college, his father died. And he decided that if he was going to do science on the scale he wanted to, he, he first had to build an independent fortune. So he jumped into money making on Wall Street. And to compress a, a long story, make it very short, um, it's all told in the book. It's a really fascinating story. But he basically financed much of the rural electrification of America. And then he just brilliantly anticipated the stock market meltdown. And um, by the 1930s, he was one of the richest men in America. Okay? At that point, he completely retired from finance. He put all of his energy and most of his money into science. Uh, as a private venture. He literally bought the house across the street from his home uh, in, in the New York City suburbs and put in a tremendous science lab there, better than any university lab in the country. And he started doing some very significant work himself. And then in 1938, Alfred Loomis went to Berlin. And he was really struck by two things, how popular Hitler was and how good the German scientists were. And he came home very concerned. He really felt that war was brewing and that science was going to have a lot to do with who won. So he poured himself and his time and his, and his money into thinking about what, you know, what, what science applications could have defense value if there is a war. And he quickly settled on using radio waves to detect moving objects. Right? And he, in a very short order, made himself the national expert on what we now call radar. And not only did he master the basic science, but he then quickly transitioned to making practical radar sets that could actually be installed in bombers and ships and on land stations. And in this way, Alfred Loomis literally turned the tide of World War II. I don't know if you realize how important radar was in the Battle of Britain or getting rid of the U-boat menace, which was really serious early in the war. Um, and um, Franklin Roosevelt later said that there was nobody who was more, no civilian who was more important to winning World War II than Alfred Loomis, <laughs> other than Winston Churchill. Um, yet I dare say many of you have probably never heard the name and certainly don't realize that it was basically a philanthropic effort that powered this. And the really just wonderful cherry on top of all this, so I'm about three quarters of the way through my research and I realized he actually left behind not only this wonderful whirlwind method, this philanthropic method, but he, he also left behind a, a flesh and blood example of his entrepreneurial philanthropy. This is his great grandson. I don't know if anybody recognizes that face. That is Reed Hastings, who, as the founder of Netflix, has completely turned upside down three separate indus industries by my count. Just a brilliant businessman and also a brilliant philanthropist. He's one of the nation's most important progenitors of charter schools. Another entrepreneurial in philanthropist who put deep imprints on America was this guy. That is George Eastman, 
who was the founder of Kodak and really popularized photography in many ways in the early 1900s. Um, when he began, he, you know, he, his company was a frantic startup, like all frantic startups. He was literally hanging a hammock in the corner of the warehouse where, where the, kept the uh, processes were, 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 were done. And at one point there was this huge failure where for two or three weeks, literally all the photos that were being sent in were coming out black. And he was just in a panic. You have to remember, in those days, the whole photographic process was just this big black box. It was all guesswork and very little science. And so he's frantic, as you can imagine. And they went to work, and it took them a while, but they finally figured out what had happened is that the cows whose carcasses get boiled down to make industrial gelatin, I don't know if you know that's where gelatin comes from, but it is. These cows had been moved to new pastures, and those pastures had a little bit less of uh, sulfur in the grasses they were eating. And that tiny change in their body chemistry was enough to just wreck the delicate photographic process. So when you can imagine, when Eastman finally figured this out, he's just frantic. That isn't going to happen again. I'm going to figure out the basic chemistry of photography so I'm not a prisoner of that kind of um, disaster. So he started hiring chemists. And he went uh, to an obscure little school in New England called Boston Tech. And he had some very good experiences with the people he hired out of Boston Tech. And, and in gratitude, when he made a lot of money, he a little bit later started funding the transformation of Boston Tech into today's MIT. He built this building, the library, he built the entire MIT campus where it currently resides. He was to a very large degree responsible for the emergence of MIT as one of the world's really great uh, institutions. Um, one of the themes of the Almanac, if you get into it, you'll see is, is that passion plays a huge role in philanthropy and in my view is never to be discouraged. One of G George Eastman's passions was music. I'll give you an example, he had a full-size pipe organ installed in his home and he hired somebody to come over every morning and play it Toccatas and Fugues to wake him up. That's li oh, wow. literally his alarm clock. And um, there's, there's just some brilliant stuff in the biographies about his, his crazy, just fr frantic love for music. There, there's an example of where he and a friend went to New York City and they took in 12 operas in six days. And she wrote in her diary, George is absolutely alcoholic about music. It's a good way of putting it, I thought. But anyway, this passion, this real passion for music led George Eastman to one of the great cultural gifts in American history. He just single-handedly, methodically powered into existence um, the Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester, whose main hall you see here. The Eastman School was really important in Americanizing classical music and in popularizing classical music. Um, it also, by the way, was really important in turning film into what was at that point really a cheap entertainment into at least potentially an art form. A lot of that happened in this auditorium uh, under his uh, direct um, impetus. And of course, today the Eastman School is one of really the great cultural institutions in, in the world. Another very idiosyncratic donor who poured money into world-changing research was this lady. This is Catherine McCormick. And by the way, it was only after I put this slide into my show I realized I think she's wearing egret feathers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have dueling philanthropists at this point. Um, anyway, Catherine McCormick um, was more than a little bit crazy, I think. Her, her <coughs> source of her fortune was the International Harvester fortune, all right? And, um, she was an early women's rights activist, and she uh, was very determined and very talented. She had some significant science training herself. And you know, I'm sure a lot of you know that there are tons of medical breakthroughs that have been driven by philanthropy. Many people know that the polio vaccine, for instance, was a product of philanthropy. I doubt many of you know that the birth control pill was the product of a sole funder, and you're looking at her. She got it in her mind that she wanted to have something that was as easy as taking an aspirin to control fertility. And she eventually hired a biologist who kind of shared that vision, and she put, by my math, about the current equivalent of about $20 million of her own money into this. And like a lot of philanthropists, she didn't just write a check and walk away. As I said, she had science training. She hovered over the lab. She was very intimately involved in all the processes of producing the, uh, the pill. And by 1957, she and this equally crazy biologist she hired had an FDA-approved pill. Um, and she just reveled in this accomplishment. Some of you who've seen how satisfying it can be for a philanthropist to produce something de novo like that might understand this. At one point, she literally had a prescription written for herself, and she walked into her local pharmacy and just had it filled, even though at that point she was a matron in her 80s. <laughs> so it's this little, little pang of pride she wanted. This is the Ford Foundation. I don't know if you realize, the Ford Foundation had a period where it was based in Southern California. and. Um, there's a wonderful quote from Dwight McDonald where he once described the Ford Foundation as, quote, a large body of money completely surrounded by people who want some. 
<laughs> and you know, you look you look at the Ford Foundation, or you look at some of these wealthy donors I've been talking about up till now, and you think, well, that's philanthropy, isn't it? Actually, that's not. That's not the full picture of American philanthropy. That's not even the mainstream of American philanthropy. I, I just need to remind you that, that philanthropy in the US is not primarily about wealthy people, and even less about big foundations. These are the actual numbers in the latest year, and you can see foundations only gave 14% of all gifts last year, and corporations only gave 5%. The rest, more than 80%, comes from individuals, and most of that comes from average families that give at a rate of about $2,500 per household. And you multiply that by hundreds of millions of households and you get big money. So that's the iceberg underneath the tip that you always see. <clears throat> now, um, you know, you'll hear critics talk that, uh, you, you'll, the, 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 people will say, well, that's lovely, but nothing you know, really important or consequential or large can be accomplished by those little givers. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that the clear verdict of American history is that those dollars are wrong, very, very wrong. Let me try to illustrate that for you a little bit. Um, the, uh, Daniel Borstein, an author some of you may have read, once noted that the state of Ohio back in 1880, all right, had three million people, population of three million, and it had 37 different colleges. At that same year, 1880, the entire nation of, of England, which had 23 million people, how many colleges do you suppose they had? Had a grand total of four. So you say, well, that's a big difference. What accounts for that? And essentially, uh, the difference is small scale education philanthropy. That was a dramatic effect just to kind of get your attention. <laughs> These are the Ohio colleges that existed in 1826. I picked that year because that was the year that Case Western Reserve, the forerunner of Case Western Reserve University was founded. That's oh, probably, you know, a very eminent college. I think something like, um, Oh, 16 Nobel winners have come out of there. Lots of businesses and companies you would have heard of are, came out of Case Western. But you know what? When Case Western was being born in 1826, it was a little dot in the middle of nowhere. This was the frontier. This was the West in America. And it was produced basically by sacrificial giving by lots of small neighbors. That's who produced Case Western. And there's just these beautiful stories. There was a, a farmer who had uh, a bunch of wagons and horses and didn't need them in the winter, so he spent all winter hauling stone for the college back and forth between the quarry and the college campus. That was his contribution. A bunch of um, local farm families that set aside a certain percentage of their egg sales and their milk sales so that the college could have some, something to grow on. Really just beautiful stories. And starting around the 1840s, uh, churches in the East began to hear these kind of tales about what was going on in the frontier and were really inspired by it. They've, they agreed that a democracy needs an educated populace and, and that the fact that actual colleges and universities were being produced in the middle of forests and cornfields in places like this was inspiring. So these churches started to cooperate in pooling together tiny little donations and sending them west to support um, 18 different colleges that they selected. And about a million dollars was raised over a period of uh, 30 years for this project. And I want to show you what the map of Ohio colleges look like after that campaign had been going on for about 25 years. You can see a big explosion. Some of these are very important to the uh, success of our country today. And by the way, I just picked Ohio because I had the data. You could pl play out the same story in lots of other places. Now I want to jump you up to the year 2015. It's easy to take these things for granted, but don't lose your capacity to be stunned by the fact that there are 50 colleges today, all right, 50, who are in the middle of a fundraising campaign that aspires to raise at least a billion dollars. That's just an amazing thing. It's not something you see in Europe or Asia or anywhere else. Um, I was surprised when I got into this to learn that even, uh, even our public universities today, I think maybe Gene Cochran was alluding to this, are very dependent upon uh, private funds. You look up the, the budgets of UVA, for instance. I looked up the budget of UVA. They get a lot more money now for private donations than they do for, from state appropriations. Same is true of UCAL Berkeley, lots of other places. They get more money from the private side than they do from, from the public, even though they are public uh, institutions. Now, um, in addition to passion being a big factor, the other factor about the, the philanthropy that's important in our country is how personal it is. Very, very personal. Not just big giving, but all giving is, is very often personally motivated. I have a million stories. I'm going to have to cut to the chase here. Let me just give you this one tale. A little bit idiosyncratic, but it's just a beautiful story. This is Michael Brown. He was a Broadway lyricist. And in the year 1956, he got lucky. He had a hit musical on his hands. And so the Brown family was much more flush than they expected to be. And so he and his wife and their two boys invited a, um, a friend, a local friend, who was far from her home. She was a Mississippian living in New York City. And they invited her over for their Christmas celebration. And toward the end of their gift exchange, they told her to go to the tree and pick off an envelope. And inside that envelope was a note. 
and that note read, you have one year off from your job to write whatever you please. Merry Christmas. And that writer's name was Harper Lee. And you know, you remember Harper Lee was a Mississippian, and when she wanted to be, when she decided she wanted to become a novelist, what do novelists, aspiring novelists do? They go to New York City. And what happens when they get there? They realize they're so darn busy trying to pay the rent, they have no time to write or work on their literary craft. In her case, she was working in a, um, an airline office in a bookstore and just making no progress. All right? And the Browns were friends, and they noticed this. They noticed that she was struggling, and they acted. They, they put their money where their mouth was. And it was during that gift year that she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, which, of course, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1961 and really changed the course of, of, uh, of literature. Um, the public libraries that house books like you know, Mockingbird um, are totally products and inventions of philanthropy. This is the main reading room of the New York City Public Library. Three families basically produced the NYPL. Boston, same way, it was the Bates family. Uh, you know, in Baltimore, it was Enoch Pratt. Um, all of the original public libraries in this country were, were fruits of philanthropy. And today, um, public libraries in our country get about a billion and a half visits every year. For me, a lot of the beauty and the power of our philanthropy derives from the fact that there's just this huge range of causes that are underwritten with our millions of donations. Um, it, you know, I don't you know if you realize, for instance, even like things like national parks, you think, well, that's kind of a national function. Well, even national parks, this is uh, Acadia Park, that was a product of philanthropy. The Virgin Islands National Park, directly from a donor, uh, Grand Tetons, Great Smoky, all of those were products of philanthropy. The really cool thing going on right now in parks philanthropies, I'm sure some of you know, is, um, is urban parks. This dates back to the, the rescue of Central Park. You know, some of you might remember Central Park just become disastrously unsafe and unkempt and a mess. And two big private donors came along and said to the city, we'll give you money to fix it, but you're going to hand over the car keys. You're going to have a different governance structure and let a nonprofit run the park as a conservancy to make sure we never get back in this mess. So that was done, and it was a huge success. I mean, the visitation rates for Central Park, last I checked, are about four or five times now what they were in the 80s. Huge, you know, beautiful uh, part of city life now. And when people saw how successful that was, they copied it in, all over the country. There are now hundreds of private park conservancies running really interesting parks in, in, uh, in cities across America. Private uh, supporters have also been very important in uh, the recovery of uh, endangered species. Again, um, you may not realize this. This is the peregrine falcon, one of my very favorite beasts. This is the fastest animal on earth, all right, when it's flying. But when it is in the bedroom reproducing, it is just absolutely a snail. No progress at all. Very, very slow. And government biologists were concerned about this and tried all kinds of things to try to turn this around. No luck at all. And the, the, the peregrine was on, uh, in, really in verge of getting into serious trouble. Then comes a a grant from this really weird, odd couple marriage of two uh, benefactors. One was the IBM Corporation, all right, all button down blue tie folks, and the other half of the equation was falconry hobbyists, all right, the guys who fly the birds off their leather gloves, you know, have fun with them. And lots and lots of little donations from one side and a big grant from the other side. Anyway, they came together and they not only pooled their money, but they pooled their ideas. Some very unconventional ideas that very likely would have gotten a government biologist fired for, for suggesting them. But one of their ideas was, you know what? Peregrines like heights and they like pigeons. Where would you put their nesting boxes if you were going to help them recover? How about on a skyscraper? Sounded like a crazy idea. It turned out to be brilliant. There are now peregrines nesting on skyscrapers all across America. And they are out of danger. Um, by the way, there's just some fabulous stories I don't have time to get into about other animal recoveries. The wolf, the bluebird, which was a classic grassroots philanthropy deal. Um, wild turkeys were brought back by hunters, basically. Um, the whooping crane is some astonishing stories about what donors did in that case. So there's, there's some really beautiful stuff. It's not, I can't get into it, but it's in the book. Um, science in general is a topic that's really closely entwined with uh, philanthropy. I had no idea until I started my research that the, the famous telescopes we all hear about when we're in grade school, you know, the Mount Wilson telescope and Mount Powell and these really important instruments, uh, those were all filled with light by philanthropists, every one of them. The Keck Observatory, all of those privately funded. And that's continuing to be the case today. The two super instruments being built right now are the so-called 30-meter telescope, which I have a picture of here. That's the 30-meter. And the Magellan, the giant Magellan telescope. These are both being funded and kicked off by, by private donations. This one, uh, it was a $250 million gift from Gordon Moore, who is the founder of Intel Corporation. They got this designed and underway. Um, 
I mentioned medical research before. I think a lot of you know the remarkable things have happened there. We did some research for Philanthropy Magazine and figured out that actually 61 separate Nobel Prize winners had their careers uh, fanned by Rockefeller research money. That's a huge. That's a huge influence on human history. All kinds of things came out of this. Blood typing came out of this. Penicillin came out of this. Yellow fever vaccine. A lot of the genetic breakthroughs that we now rely on. Um, and you know, those triumphs, all of these triumphs I've been describing have made an effect on the public. One of the things we did for the Almanac was to commission an original national poll. And for instance, when asked, what would your first choice be for solving a social problem in America, to use government or to use philanthropic aid? Uh, the answers were 47% of adults chose philanthropy and 32% chose government. Um, we had a question that asked people who they trusted most, charities or entrepreneurial companies or government agencies when it came to addressing the most pressing issues of the day. And the answers were 43% trusted charities, 28% trusted entrepreneurial companies, and just 14% trusted government agencies. Um, then we gave people a choice between putting stricter controls on philanthropy or giving philanthropy a really wide latitude to kind of operate and solve problems as it deemed best. And the public overwhelmingly chose the first course. They said give, give charities a wide berth by 61% to 28 percent. Then we tried to even kind of make it even t tighter focus. We asked whether tax deductions for charity should be maybe capped or eliminated and the public overwhelmingly said no, 79 percent to 16 percent. And then the final place we really tried to kind of probe was we, we pushed people to say, is it fair if you have two families that are identical in all ways, income, family structure, and so forth, the only difference between them is that one uh, has a lower tax bill because of their charitable giving and the other than the other has. And people said, no problem. We can live with that. That's fine. 66% to 21%. So the public understands that charitable giving is a, is a, is a social contribution unto itself. And there's m more from this poll in, in the almanac. So with that, I will quit. I'm afraid I've really only just scratched the surface. Please do take a book away with you and, and, and pick it up and learn more. And I hope I've convinced you that, if nothing else, that philanthropy is just a huge, fascinating, and powerful aspect of our culture. And that, again, it's not just a sideline. It's really at the heart of our national success. So I salute you for your role in that and hope you can spread that message. Thank you very much.